It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Um, Premier, our, our point of view on this side of the House is that the focus of government should be creating an environment for more jobs with better take-home pay. Sure. You, you seem to have, based on your legislative agenda, like uh, regulating menus in the province, you seem to have other priorities. Soaring electricity costs have taken Ontario from a competitive advantage in energy to now among the highest costs of energy in, in North America. That's costing us jobs. That means investment goes to other provinces. The leading driver, the, the greatest pressure for increased costs are your unaffordable subsidies for wind and solar projects. So, Premier, given the damage your, pro your government has already caused to the Green Energy Act, isn't it time to call an end to this madness and end those subsidies that we simply <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, you know, I think that the uh, the leader of the opposition should talk to the people who are in those 31,000 jobs that have been created, Mr. Speaker, because of the Green Energy Act. And the fact is that there are 255. I'm. Uh, I want uh, those people that uh, are speaking while I'm trying to get their attention to be warned, and uh, I, I am not going to allow the shouting down of anyone today. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There are 255 contracts in place which the uh, Leader of the Opposition says that they would cancel. Well, he says they would cancel, then an official in their office says they wouldn't cancel them, so it's, it's actually unclear. But were he to move ahead with what he's saying he would do, Mr. Speaker, cancel those contracts, that would expose the province to a risk of up to $20 billion in cost, Mr. Speaker. That is not responsible. That is what the Tory plan would do, Mr. Speaker, and we are certainly not going to buy Thank into you. that. <laughs> well, well, look, the, the only party that's cancelled contracts in this province is a Liberal Party. And <laughs> and, and that cost us over a billion dollars. And, and yesterday, Premier, you couldn't even, meeting face to face with Maddie Vanstone, promise that this girl could have an access to pharmaceutical treatment in our province because you'd rather spend a billion dollars cancelling gas ban contracts in the province of Ontario. That's the consequence of your decision. So, my point of view is turn off the tap, stop doing the damage. The Premier says that she's seen 31,000 jobs created where? building wind where? turbines and solar panels. I invite the Premier then to table exactly where those jobs are because, quite frankly, I don't believe you. But the Auditor General Question. said that for every short term job you create building turbines, you lose four in the broader economy. So, help me with the math. Why are you preferring 31,000 jobs to the 124,000 jobs you lost as a result of higher hiring? Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. You're not helping. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and as the Leader of the Opposition knows, uh, all of the parties in the Legislature agreed and campaigned on uh, canceling the gas tax, Mr. Speaker. It's only the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, who are continuing to suggest that cancelling contracts that uh, could expose uh, the province to costs of up to $20 billion, they're saying that that would be a responsible way forward, Mr. Speaker. But I think, I think, what, is, uh, I think what is most disturbing about what the uh, Leader of the Opposition is doing this morning, Mr. Speaker, is he's not being clear. He's, he's saying, on the one hand, that he would cancel contracts that would uh, cost up to $20 billion, and then, and then he's saying, no, he wouldn't cancel the contracts. I think, it, uh, I think it's only fair to ask what exactly would he do and what would the cost that he Answer. would expose the province to, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. So, final supplementary. Well, what I do is stop wasting money. They only sign power contracts that are affordable whenever we need it. And in fact, um, Premier, you know, we laid that plan out over two years ago. It's got reliable and affordable energy. I've shared that with you. I only wish that you had taken some, at least some aspects of that plan instead of doubling down on Dalton McGinley's approach. Uh, I know that it's a, a new voice and a new name on the Premier's office, but you're basically a clone of Dalton McGuinty when it comes to his harmful policies. My point of view, this has been a reckless and expensive policy. The auditor says we lose four jobs for every short-term job we create in the province of Ontario. So if the biggest issue is jobs. If we're losing jobs every day to Michigan or Chicago, 
where the energy prices are half our cost, why are you digging in the hole deeper? Stop this madness now. End the unfair subsidies. We can't afford it. Let's focus on job creation here in the province of Ontario, not in New York, not in Michigan, right here in the province of Ontario. Okay. Thank you. Bring it, Minister Mr. Speaker, I want to use a couple of examples to respond to the Leader of the Opposition. Let's talk about Canadian Solar, which is a manufacturing facility in Guelph. Yes. I believe they have somewhere around 300, 300 jobs there, Mr. Speaker. Very significant for that community. They are a world leader in terms of their technology, and they are exporting their product. Let's talk, Mr. Speaker, about Celestica, which is a uh, solar company that manufactures right here in Toronto. They've got two or three hundred employees in their facility, Mr. Speaker. They are exporting product, and they're cutting edge uh, in this particular area, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about Siemens in southwest Ontario, Mr. Speaker, where they are continuing to add jobs. I had lunch with senior executives about three weeks ago, and in addition to the jobs that have been announced with that project, Mr. Speaker, Answer. they are creating another. 150 jobs in administration and in their product. Mr. Speaker, we have been creating jobs in the Green Energy Act. We're going to continue Thank to you. do so. And they Thank you. New question. Leader, Leader of the Opposition. You're back. Back to the Premier, if I could. Um, you, you know what? I, I, I'd love to spend the time reciting all the 300,000 job losses in a province. In fact, the matter is put in perspective, Premier. We could have everybody who lost the 300,000 manufacturing jobs as a result of higher energy costs. They, they could actually fill the gallery like the students here today, every day, seven days a week for eight straight years. That's been the impact of your damaging and reckless policies to our province. So here's the other thing. Now you've lost a World Trade Organization ruling. Japan and the European Union sued us because of the Made in Ontario provisions in your Green Energy Act. So that is now being removed. So this basically means your old premise was we would lose four jobs in manufacturing to create one job in solar or wind in Ontario. Now we're going to lose four Question. jobs in Ontario for every job we're going to create in Europe or China or Japan. That math doesn't make sense. It's not in the interest of Ontarians. I'll ask you again, Premier, just stop this madness, repeal the policy. Thank you. Let's focus on jobs in Ontario. Instead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and the uh, leader of the, of the opposition knows that we're taking the necessary steps to comply with the World Trade Organization ruling, Mr. Speaker. He also knows that this, this will mean a reduction in the cost to Ontarians of electricity of uh, $1.9 billion over the next four years. So that's actually one of the ways that costs are being taken out of the system, Mr. Speaker. So the plan that the, well, or the non-plan that the uh, leader is putting forward would cost the province jobs, Mr. Speaker. He would cancel contracts that could expose the province to costs of up to $20 billion. He would not comply, apparently, with the World Trade Organization ruling, which is taking $1.9 billion out of the system, Mr. Speaker. So it's very, very uh, reasonable to ask exactly what would he do, Mr. Speaker, to have a reliable energy Answer. source going forward, clean renewables, Mr. Speaker, and a stable electricity system. Thank you. Supplementary. What would I do? I'd, un I'd end the unaffordable subsidies for wind and solar. I thought I had been clear on this, uh, Speaker. No, look, this. Um, I to be very serious about this, you, you've lost a World Trade Organization ruling. I think I, I, I know you've been briefed on that. It's very serious. And the problem is you lost that almost a year ago. And because of your incompetence or bungling, I'm not sure what happened on that side of the House, uh, we're not going to be compliant in all likelihood by March 24th, which leaves us open to a trade repercussions and trade war. But it seems to me also, when you look at the premise of your argument, that we're going to lose jobs in manufacturing to create jobs in wind and solar, if you eliminate the Made in Ontario provisions, you're going to lose jobs in Ontario to create jobs in China and Japan. I mean, how is that in the interest of Ontarians? It seems to me, instead of going down that path, a pro-China jobs policy, bringing a pro-Ontario jobs policy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the member from Halton come to order and the member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. Minister of Energy. The leader of the opposition is so far over his head, it's embarrassing. 
Okay. You know, wow. really, wow. every single, every single renewable contract that we have issued, those which have been completed, and 255 which are still in production, Mr. Speaker, get the benefit of domestic content. We have created a viable, best class. To manufacturing facilities uh, in the world, Mr. Speaker, in the ones that I mentioned earlier, Canadian Solar and Celestica. But what is important, Mr. Speaker, is they have an unnamed spokesperson saying, if the minister decided that we didn't need the power, if the local municipality wasn't welcoming of the project and it didn't make sense on the cost and benefit analysis, then we would exercise the termination clause that already exists. Mr. Speaker, we have the legal opinion which says fit contracts Thank allow you. for termination only in cases Thank where project. Thank you. You're only stealing your leader's time. Final supplementary. Talk, Premier, about the human cost of the 300,000 lost manufacturing jobs as a result of your reckless energy policies. And then there's Shelley Carrera. Shelley lives in West Lincoln. She leads the organization Mothers Against Wind Turbines in the province. In fact, uh, our member for Huron Bruce, Lisa Thompson, organized a rally here on behalf of against the Mothers Against Wind Turbines. Um, I think, as you know, uh, Ms. Carrera has a son who's been diagnosed with sensory processing issues. He has ADHD, very sensitive to noise. That's why she's risen up to be an advocate, a leading advocate for mothers on behalf of their kids. She lives near potential turbines. She, like other mothers, are fighting for their children's well-being. Big corporations with connections to the Liberal Party are quashing the little guy when it comes to this policy as Question. well. When you launch your leadership, you talk about creating a more fair and just society. What is fair but well-connected companies quashing the rights of Ms. Carrera, her son, and Thank other hard-working families across the country? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Oh Mr. God. Speaker, I would like to make two points. Number one, we have the Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health who has indicated that uh, this is an appropriate and healthy uh, industrial infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. The member from the Huron Bruce come to order. The know, member from Chatham Kent Essex come to order. in a significant way been uh, replacing dirty coal. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, that's the largest climate change. Attorney General in come to order. Mr. Speaker, the health impacts of getting out of dirty coal. $4.4 billion in avoided, avoided health care and environmental costs. 668 fewer premature, premature deaths per year. 928 fewer hospital admissions per year. 1,100 fewer emergency room visits per year. And 333,000 fewer minor illnesses such as headache. Answer. Speaker, it is one of the best health initiatives we've taken in this province in our history to get rid of dirty coal, which they expanded. The I remind the uh, Minister of Energy when I stand, you sit, and when I stand, everyone sits, and when I stand, everyone is quiet. And I will take this time to may remind you that my patience is very thin with members calling each other by names, and I'm going to deal with it. It does not elevate the debate. It lowers it. Stop. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Why are families and businesses still getting overcharged by Hydro One on their bills? Premier. Minister of Energy. The Minister of Energy. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Hydro One has 1.3 million customers, um, and uh, a number of them, a small number of them, Mr. Speaker, uh, have had billing errors. Uh, I want to be very clear, Mr. Speaker. The, the CEO of Hydro One has apologized, and I've indicated in this House we share in the apology for the inconvenience that has been caused to, uh, to uh, people who have received these improper billings. But, Mr. Speaker, the CEO has made it very, very clear 
that no one will have to pay anything extra, that if there are late charges or interest charges or they need time to pay, Mr. Speaker, they will be given that time. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a high-tech system, Mr. Speaker. There were four Answer. stages to it. Three stages uh, went off very, very well, Mr. Speaker. And the CEO has taken on additional staff, and he's assuring everybody that they will not have anything extra to pay. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Why are overbilled Hydro One customers not getting the refunds that they were promised, Speaker? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the, the Hydro One operations have taken on additional staff. They are calling and dealing with individual customers one by one to meet that particular challenge and to deal with the, uh, with the issues around improper bills. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, nobody is paying extra, nobody is paying interest, nobody is paying late charges, nobody is getting cut off. And Mr. Speaker, they have 1.3 million customers. The overwhelming majority of them are being properly served. The these errors are being rectified, Mr. Speaker, and I would ask the member if she has anybody who's got a complaint with respect to the billing to please bring it Answer. to our attention. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, Ontario families are having a hard enough time paying their actual hydro bills without getting dinged for hundreds and sometimes thousands of extra dollars. Hydro One promised to fix the errors, but people are still being overbilled, Speaker. Hydro One promised refunds, but people haven't seen them. Hydro One only has one shareholder, Speaker. It's the province. What is the government doing on behalf of the people that they represent to fix these problems? Mr. Speaker, nobody is paying extra as a result of the billing errors. The CEO has made been very, very clear, Mr. Speaker, that nobody will be liable for any of those payments. There will be no interest charges. There will be no disconnections. They have a huge team now in Hydro One that are dealing with those people who have been affected, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and the, uh, the CEO uh, and the team is working personally with, uh, with the people who have been involved. Mr. Speaker, they've acted professionally, and uh, we're extremely proud of the fact that Hydro One has has been rated, Mr. Speaker, as one of the best utilities in North America. Answer. Top, top five. Thank you. Wow. Question. Leader of the third party. Speaker, my next question is for the Premier, and I'd prefer an actual answer instead of boosterism on Hydro One. Simone Leferrier is a resident of Timmins. Her normal hydro bill is about $350 a month. This January, she received a bill that was three times that amount. She complained to Hydro One, and this month, her bill was nearly three times the normal amount again. Does the Premier think that this is acceptable? Premier. Mr. Speaker, we understand that there has been significant inconvenience and Hydro One, and we apologize, Mr. Speaker. We apologize for that. And the fact is that the Minister of Energy has outlined the uh, initiatives that Hydro One is taking to correct the issue. If the leader of the third party is aware of people for whom this has still not been the case, where the correction has not happened, then we need to know that, we need to have that information, and the situation will be corrected, Mr. Member Speaker. Bruce Gray, Hydro One Sound is taking Calor. action, and no one will have to pay extra because of the error that were made, the, the errors that were made uh, administratively. Those those errors are being corrected. Mr. Answer. There you go. Supplementary. I beg to differ. Ina Lamoureux lives in Inglehart. On January 20th, she was hit with not one, not two, but Mr. six Training bills College University has come to on the same day. Hydro One had already tried to clear out her bank account last summer with a $1,500 bill that they admit was an error. However, they still will not give Ina her money back. Why is the Premier ignoring the plight of Ina and thousands like her? Question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're not, in fact. And when the Ombudsman came to me and we had a conversation about uh, his concern about Hydro One, I was able to say that we were already concerned about it, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad that the Ombudsman is looking at the situation. But the fact is, Hydro One is already taken action, Mr. Speaker. And if there are individuals and the name, I don't know whether the leader of the third party is going to have other names, if there are names of people 
people who are still in a situation where they have not had the uh, refund, Mr. Speaker, or they're still concerned about the bill, then Hydro One would like to know that. The Minister of Energy would like to have those names. It was a mistake. It shouldn't have happened. It's being corrected, Mr. Speaker. And if the leader of the third party has names, we'd like to have that information. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's heartening that the Premier is concerned already since I first sent a letter about this issue back in 2010 to their Minister of Energy. For families and businesses paying the highest hydro bills in Canada, this is yet another example of an electricity system that simply is not working for them. People who are already paying the price for cancelled gas plants, failed private power schemes and subsidized power exports have a simple question for this Premier. When will the government stop overcharging on their hydro bills and give them back the money that they are owed? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not sure how much clearer we can be that yeah. there were mistakes made, those mistakes are being corrected. If there are still people who have a problem, who have been overcharged, Mr. Speaker, that needs to be corrected, and Hydro One is in the process of doing that. In North Quinty West, are come to order. Told, Mr. Speaker, there are extra staff that are doing that work, and if there are individuals who have not yet had uh, that respite, Mr. Speaker, then we need to have that information. And we look forward to the leader of the third party giving it to us if she chooses, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. A new question. The member from the Carlton. Mr. Speaker, my question is as well to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Uh, the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party has had a long standing opposition to the Green Energy Act. We know that for every job it creates, we lose four more. Those are the auditor's numbers, not just ours. We know, for example, that municipalities across Ontario are opposed to this because they've had their locally based decision making stripped. We know, for example, that no health and scientific studies were done prior to the Green Energy Act being in place, and now Health Canada has to come in and clean up the mess of this Liberal government. And finally, Speaker, we know from travelling across the province that the Green Energy Act is the single biggest driver of increasing hydro costs in this province. And if those, if those facts weren't enough for this government, they would surely know that when they broke the world's Question. energy laws, that enough was enough. And Attorney that was General comes to order. Will they scrap the Green Energy Act so we can Thank finally you. get prices under control? You see it, please? The Attorney General will come to order. Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I too am energized this morning, uh, especially with my uh, special uh, uh, Sault Ste. Marie uh, tie. Beautiful. Uh, compliments of uh, the member over there. But I will say, Mr. Speaker, Looks better uh, than fix. this party across there thinks they know what what renewable energy is all about. So what they do is they introduce a Million Jobs Act, Mr. Speaker. In the Million Dollars Act, they say they are going to cancel existing, 255 existing renewable contracts with wind developers. That's $20 billion of power supply, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition is smiling. He should be embarrassed by the act that he introduced here. Mr. Speaker, there will be a cost associated with the cancellations. Answer. That is a legal opinion that we have. They believe at the end of the process, when the developer has complied with all provisions, their Minister of Energy, if they ever get to foreign Thank government, you. will be able to cancel Thank the contract. Thank you. Time's up. Supplementary. That was bizarre, Speaker. So I'm just going to say this. If anybody should be embarrassed, it's the last decade of the climb by this government as they drove hydro rates through the roof, as they broke international law, as they ignored the fact that we need health and scientific studies on the GEA. It's the fact that we are losing jobs because of this government. They should be embarrassed. But, Speaker, this is a government that is beyond reproach, and I'll tell you why. They're not only happy, happy with having an OPP investigation launched into them on the gas plants, they're not only happy having a gas, uh, the OPP investigation investigate them on orange. They also are international lawbreakers. My leader has stated that Bill 153, which is supposed to bring Canada into compliance at the WTO, has, has, will not pass by the deadline. We know that this is going to embarrass the federal government. It could put our province into an international trade war. Will they do the right thing? Will they stand with us? Will they eliminate the Green Energy Act to make sure Canada is no longer embarrassed? 
You see it, please? The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, is not doing himself any favors. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, if that party ever got to be in power, no, no, they would spend from Chatham, Chatham, $20 Essex, billion come dollars to order, on second new nuclear time. that we don't need. They would send prices skyrocketing. Member from the P and Carlton will come to order. If that party got in power, they would cancel $20 billion in contracts. Wow. Legal contracts, Mr. Speaker, they want the right to cancel contracts that developers are 100 per cent in compliance with, Mr. Speaker. That is the type of government they're going to have. Energy rates would soar under that party the way they soared when they were in government before, Mr. Speaker. They have no credible plan. They don't understand the for Prince energy. Edward Hastings they don't will understand come to order. Health care that benefits from renewable energy. I coached a hockey team, Mr. Speaker, where six kids on the bench had asthma. Mr. Excuse me. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I, uh, I'm disappointed in some of the comments that some people are making, and I will just jump right to warnings now. including the person that just uh, gave me some armchair quarterbacking. New question. The member from Bramley gore -Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In 2010, this government made changes to the Ontario insurance regime that resulted in a slash to benefits for victims and handed the insurance industry approximately $2 billion in savings. This boosted the industry's profits Sorry. Directed question, please. The Premier. My apologies. Today, the government made another announcement that will ch make more changes to benefit the insurance companies to reduce their costs. But the people in Ontario are wondering, will the minister answer this question? When will the people in Ontario see some speedy action to see their rates go down? Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, this morning uh, the member opposite is referencing the fact that we're going to be introducing legislation this afternoon talking about we are reducing rates. And I'm pleased to say that we've re reduced rates. We're on target to reduce rates by 15 per cent over the next two years. And that is because of the work that we as government have been doing over the last five years, including attacking fraud, eliminating uh, the issues of disputes, trying to facilitate, accelerate the, the benefits to the victims. And in all, Mr. Speaker, we need to reduce those claim costs in order to establish better premiums. The member opposite knows that full well. He himself agreed with us over two years to reduce it by 15 per cent, and we're on track to do just that. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has a choice, Mr. Speaker. They can either pass on a portion of the $2 billion in savings that the industry is enjoying, or they can sit back and continue to allow the insurance companies to slash benefits and pocket the savings. God bless. The government says the rates are coming down, but the reality is many people in Ontario don't see that. They don't see their rates coming down. In fact, they see their rates climbing. You can spin the numbers, but you can't change the facts. Drivers need relief in Ontario. Today, the government has made an announcement that they're going to make more changes to bring down the cost for insurance companies. But what guarantee is it? that their costs will go down for drivers in Ontario. When will the government make some speedy action for drivers for once, as opposed to the insurance companies? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I find this very passing strange. The member opposite is suggesting that rates are not coming down. In fact, third party has indicated that rates are coming down, and they've been coming down in the first six months since we introduced it, well ahead of what was anticipated, and we'll continue to do that. That's why we have instituted some of the recommendations by Justice Cunningham around dispute resolution. That's why we're looking at the rate of interest that's held so that the benefits can be given to the victims more quickly. That's why we're looking at storage and ensuring that victims aren't being abused in the system. That's why we're looking at the agent and adjusters and providing great 
greater enforcement so that there's more disciplinary action to reduce those causes of fraud. And that is why we're looking at health clinics, knowing full well that in Ontario it's much more expensive yes, to service our needs than it is in other provinces. We need to address that, and we are, all with the intent of reducing premiums. The member opposite knows that full well. Thank you. We have taken action. Rates are coming Thank down. Thank you. New question. The member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Education. In my great riding of Oak Ridge's Markham, there are over 70 elementary and secondary schools. When I speak with my constituents who live in our new subdivisions, they always ask when their schools will be built. On Friday, the minister did make an important announcement in Cornell in my riding, which signaled a continued commitment to investing in people. However, in rapidly growing communities such as mine, there is always anxiety about services matching needs. Can the minister please inform us about the record of her ministry's investment in the future of Ontario's students? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And I really like to commend the member from Oak Ridge's Markham, who's a fierce advocate. For for her, uh, for her riding and for her, uh, the schools in particular in her riding. So um, let me tell you something about the schools, the elementary and secondary schools in, in Ontario. In fact, elementary, the education real estate portfolio is worth $52 billion. It's actually the biggest real estate portfolio of any Ontario ministry. And we've actually invested twelve million or twelve billion dollars in that portfolio over the last ten years. What that means is that since two thousand and three, we've invested twelve billion dollars in good places to learn for Ontario students and twelve yes, billion dollars for workers in Ontario who work in the construction industry. And in Markham, this year we have just announced Thank a $50 you. million dollar construction. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and I know that uh, my constituents were extremely happy to hear that two new schools will be built in my riding, which has almost doubled in population over the last 10 years. These new schools will ensure that despite my ri riding's rapid growth, students will not have to attend overcrowded schools. It is my understanding that school boards across Ontario submitted some 260 capital project proposals in the past year. I know my community was not the only one to benefit from recent investments in education infrastructure. Speaker, through you, can the minister please inform the House about the process by which the ministry approves these capital well investments? Good minister. Yes, thank you. And in fact, uh, the member is correct that the, the ratio of submissions to actual approvals is about five to one, and we actually do this in a very very rigorous way. We ask each school board to submit detailed business cases for their top eight priorities. And my, the staff at my ministry go through each of those business cases and score them. And the projects are actually awarded on the strength of the business cases that are submitted to my ministry. This year, we will be announcing over the next few weeks a $700 million in additional projects. And I was very pleased on Friday that we could announce two projects in Markham. In addition to those projects, we announced three new schools and two additions in Waterloo Region, two new schools and four secondary programs upgrades in Guelph and Dufferin County, Answer. four new elementary schools in Brampton, a new elementary school in Kleinberg. Actually, that's four new element. Yeah, four new elementary schools in Brampton. Thank you. So significant investments. Thank you. New question, the member for Whitby, Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, Maddie Van Stone is a very courageous girl, but as courageous as she is, she needs your help. She needs your help to get access to a life-saving drug, Kaleidico. Kaleidico allows Maddie to feel like a normal 12-year-old girl, free from symptoms of cystic fibrosis. Yesterday in the House, the Premier said she wants to fund Kaleidico, but can't. But, Minister, you know that you and the Premier both have the power to make this happen. Will you stand today and commit to funding Kaleidico for me? Thank you. Thank you. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Oh, well, Speaker, I, uh, I was delighted to meet Maddie and her mom yesterday. Maddie is a very courageous young woman, a very articulate young woman, who is benefiting tremendously from, uh, from the drug that she has been on now for seven months. Uh, the member opposite knows that this is a breakthrough drug. This is a drug that does, uh, for a small subset of people with cystic fibrosis, improve their quality of life. We are negotiating at a pan-Canadian level. All health ministers across the country have agreed to, uh, to negotiate with Vertex, the pharmaceutical company based in the United States, to get the best value for money. If you are suggesting we just play, we just pay whatever price the pharmaceutical company asks us yes, to pay, I disagree. We must negotiate. That allows us to fund more drugs for more people. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, both the Minister and the Premier continue to hide behind the Pan-Canadian Pricing Alliance, saying that their hands are tied. But you know, that's an answer that even little Maddie Vanstone didn't buy. The fact of the matter is, you do not need the permission of the Alliance Order. to take action. Minister, you have an opportunity to be a leader here. You have the power to fund Kaleidico for Maddie, and you don't need to wait for anyone or anything in order to take action. Minister, this child's life may be on the line in a few months if her personal fundraising runs out. Will you commit to funding Kaleidico for that? Thank you. Uh, you it, please. You it, please. Minister of Health. Well, uh, Speaker, uh, as I said earlier, this is a pan-Canadian process, and all of the progressive conservative health ministers, including the Minister of Alberta and other provinces with a progressive conservative government are in the very same position when we negotiate together we will get we do get better prices we've successfully negotiated 29 new drugs uh, for uh, 28 new drugs for 31 conditions speaker and we've been able to do that to work together. The member opposite is saying, fund one drug for one child. That is not the way we can do this. We cannot do this on a one-off. And I, Speaker, I believe the system is working. We have to get Vertex, the US-based, publicly traded pharmaceutical company to actually negotiate with us, Speaker. Answer. Three offers have been put on the table. Three offers have been rejected. The buy. responsibility is with that company to negotiate. Thank you. Question the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety. Speaker, the original $113 million security budget for the Pan Am Games has more than doubled to $239 million. And the minister said that the cost of security is not included in the total cost of the games. So we had the cost of the athletes' village not included in the total games costs and estimates, and now we have this bloated security cost not included in the total cost of the games. We still don't have a contract. Speaker, what other multi-million dollar surprises has this government got for us at the Pan Am Parapan Games costs. Thank you. Minister in response, uh, Minister of Corrections and Mr. Speaker, thank you very much uh, to the member for his question. The uh, security of our athlete, coach, and visitors to the Pan Am Games is our utmost responsibility and desire. So we have been uh, planning the security uh, headed by the OPP, it's an integrated security group, uh, and part of this integrated security group, there is nine uh, different police force around the uh, GTA region. So the, there was a forecast uh, uh, about the cost of uh, security, and of course, then we went further than that. We went to see what was what happened in uh, in uh, Vancouver, what happened in uh, in uh, Mexico, what happened in London, and got advice from them in what should we do and what should we uh, uh, move forward with to prevent, you know, what happened let's say, in London. So the the cost Thank of you. security. The uh, sup supplementary. Supplement. Thank you, Speaker. I think we were. I said for the Pan Am Village. 
Speaker, the minister claims that the day-to-day -day security costs will be less than 2010 Vancouver Olympics. But how can that be true when security costs are already more than double the original budget with 16 months to go to the Games? This makes it very hard to believe the costs will not continue to escalate. And Speaker, will the minister provide Ontarians with the true current cost of law enforcement and security and the believable, believable projection of the real cost for these games? Thank you, Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, I rely very much uh, on the expert, not on uh, you know MPP around the province, but on the expert. So we have you know adding this uh, this this group, a very uh, professional, very experienced in uh, uh, police officer in uh, different large uh, event like the uh, the Olympic and the uh, Pan Am. So we will uh, we will continue. Uh, we have now uh, a forecast which is 239 million. It did increase because we have increased the number of venues. We have increased the number of days, and we that's why you know the costs have uh, have increased. But I will not negotiate here the safety of the uh, yes, of the uh, of the athlete, the safety of the coach, and the safety of the visitor. So I trust the good advice that we got from our professional you. in your municipality. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a, a second time, I'm going to remind people: when I stand, you sit down. New question, Member of Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my questions for the uh, the Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister, small rural and northern communities have had chronic challenges, I think it's fair to say, for some time. Uh, unlike challenges that our larger municipalities tend to face, they usually have or often can have large geographic land bases and relatively small tax bases to fund their needs. We've responded uh, with a number of programs. I think it's fair to say the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, uh, the Eastern Ontario Development Fund, and I know uh, one of the programs that you as the Minister of Rural Affairs are very proud of, the RED program, the Rural Economic Development Fund. It's a, a program that I've had success with in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan as well. So, Minister, I wonder if you, uh, in your capacity responsible for rural affairs, can tell this House uh, what that program has been able to do for these kinds of municipalities in our province. Thank you. Right. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, my good friend and hardworking member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for that uh, insightful question this morning. You know, in today's economy, it's essential for municipalities to adapt to changing economic conditions, and that's why initiatives like RED are so important. Just to give you a bit of background, Mr. Speaker, since 2003, Ontario has invested $167 million in 418 RED projects right money. across this province. Uh, generating about $1.2 billion in local economic activity and creating more than 35,000 jobs. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm always reminded of a great quote from one William Grenville Davis when he was Premier of the Province of Ontario. Mr. Davis used to always say that Ontario is still a province of small towns with big dreams. So just yesterday, over the last couple of months, I had the mayor of Port Hope come to see me, Answer. and the mayor of Coburg to see me. We provided them yesterday, Port Hope, $100,000 for their downtown revitalization program, $125,000 for the town of po uh, Coburg for their downtown revitalization program. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, thank you. Minister, thank you for, uh, for that answer. Uh, one of the programs that we have, a similar program focused specifically on Northern Ontario, of course, is the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, a program we're very proud of in the North. Originally started by the Peterson government in the late 80s, funded at $60 million annually. We've increased that now to $100 million annually, a huge additional commitment to the people of Northern Ontario, and I would say it's doing great work. A program also that uh, businesses, I think it's fair to say, like NOAC, represented by the Northwestern Ontario Associated Chambers of Commerce, have long asked for because businesses in Northern Ontario historically have a challenge accessing capital. So programs like the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, the Eastern Fund, and I would say the new permanent $100 million infrastructure fund under the Minister of Transportation, along with the RED program. There's a whole suite of programs that are now available to help our small, Question. rural and northern communities. So, Minister, can you tell us again, in terms of the long-term viability for our small, northern and rural municipalities, what that suite of programs can provide? Well, thank 
Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, wonderful supplementary question from the, the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan. You know, he's long been a champion of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. And when I've been touring Northern Ontario, whether it's in the great community of North Bay or Timmins or Thunder Bay, uh, they, uh, Sudbury, they all are very appreciative of the Nor Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. And just yesterday, I had the opportunity to chat with some leaders from Northern Ontario through live streaming for the first ever Rural Ontario Summit. We heard yesterday from Dr. David Freshwater and Dr. Rob Greenwood, experts in rural development, coming forward with good ideas that they share with everybody through the great Ontario Rural Institute. We brought together local leaders in economic development, business, health care, social services, and municipal government. The backbone, as Mr. Davis used to say, small towns with big dreams. It was a Answer. great opportunity to discuss the social and economic infrastructure issues that will shape the future, the great future of rural Ontario. And I look forward to keep building on the successes of our local communities as we develop the good public policy. New question. Um, I, I, don't, I, I find it. Stop the clock. I, I don't know what's going on, but quite frankly, when I stand up, you're supposed to be speaking to the speaker. You should see that the speaker's standing up. When I stand up, you sit down. I, I don't understand this. New question. Member from Barry. Training lessons over there. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Minister, no matter how often you say the on time and on budget mantra, it won't make it true. Yesterday, you got caught on repeat exactly at the same time a 15% budget increase was being announced for security. It seems the budget and your credibility are inversely related. The budget skyrockets, your credibility plummets. This is the most expensive Pan Am Games ever. Minister, will you step down so that someone who can handle multi-billion dollar games can take over and actually protect our tax dollars? Here, here, here. <laughs> Minister, responsible for Pan Am, Pan Am Air Games. Thank you, Speaker. This is another new round of random attack of the Pan and Parapan American game by the member opposite. Speaker, over time, the member has made many, many allegations simply not true or not correct. He said security cost is $1 billion. Right now, he's sending it $239 million. He said a reception cost half a million dollars. It actually is, Speaker, five times lower. He said the budget is too high. At the same time, he's complaining the security cost and the transportation cost, they are too low. Speaker, the member opposite is very confusing, very conflicting. This is why I said he has zero credibility. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. That's pretty rich from that source. Wow. Uh, Speaker, that is rich coming from that minister who has zero credibility, who has seen a payment zero. budget double, has hidden multiple budgets among multiple mi ministries. Pitted communities Look, against each other. It's not just the being on budget that eludes you, Minister. It's being on time that's also becoming an issue. To date, you have not produced a transportation plan. We ask for it in an order paper, we asked for it in question period, and you gave me your empty words that it would be completed by late 2013. Even the first on, vice Freeman. president of the Pan American Sports Organization has significant concerns about the traffic issues in the GTA. You fired the, sec the, you fired the secretariat deputy minister, you fired the TO 2015 CEO. Minister, you are the common denominator uh -oh. here. The file is still out of control, and you lack the cultural sensitivity to be the Pan Am Minister. Will you step down and yeah. resign today? Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Order. Order. Minister of Finance, Minister of Health, member from Kitchener Conestoga. Minister. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, for the for the question. Uh, my encouragement to the member opposite Speaker: stop bad mouthing the game, Speaker. Security and safety of the people is paramount here, here. and is on here, the top here. of my agenda. <laughs> Speaker, we will not compromise the safety of the people. We will protect them 
at any hall speaker. Yeah. Our own MPP, our, our own OPP is the lead institution on this file speaker, partnering with the RCMP local police forces and security firms. Yeah, the latest cost estimate, Garfield. Speaker, is 239 million. They are working hard on this file to ensure come 2015, Answer. Ontario will welcome all the people to come and enjoy the game. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question? The member from Hamilton Mountain. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. When moms and dads of this province drop their kids off at daycare, they expect to pick them up again at the end of the day. But at least four families in less than a year have not been able to do that. Their children died at daycare. Parents expect the government to do its part to keep kids safe, and they expect to know when and where these tragedies have occurred. Speaker, can the minister tell this House how many children have died in licensed and unlicensed daycares over the past decade? And if not, why not? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we, the, there is a gap in information here, and there's a gap in information which is as frustrating to me as to anybody else in this place. So, what we, unfortunately, what we find is that when the police investigate uh, an unfortunate death, as we have seen in a few, few situations this year, that that information does not necessarily come back to the Ministry of Education. So I have asked my deputy, it is true, they, uh, he's not listening, um, the, when I have asked my deputy minister to see if there is something we can do so that we actually get the information coming back to my child care branch. At the moment, the Answer. information around child deaths and their cause does not come back to my child care branch. So I've asked my deputy to see if there is a way that Thank we you. can resolve this and get the information. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, back to the minister. I was listening. I'm just not hearing anything. Yeah. This government is dropping the ball. Last year, the coroner investigated 220 deaths of children under the age of five, and the coroner reports daycare deaths to the ministry. Yet the minister can't answer questions about how many kids have died in daycares and whether that number of deaths is increasing. Speaker, the government can't just shrug its shoulders any longer. There is no excuse for not tracking deaths in this province. Will the minister explain how her department has failed to keep the Will the minister explain how her department has failed to keep to keep track of these tragedies? Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I, have spe I specifically did ask my officials to check last week when the claim was made in the media that uh, the coroner reported this information to my ministry. When we checked that, we found that that, in fact, is not a reporting link that, is, that currently exists. The coroner's office reports back to the police, and the police may or may not choose to report back to the Ministry of Education, which is precisely why I have asked my deputy to look into the matter and see if we can improve the reporting. Answer. Thank you. New question. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Speaker, last month I was pleased to announce uh, that our government is now in a position to for uh, go forward with the cleanup of a contaminated waste disposal site in my riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell. This site is the waste lagoon of the former Canadian International Paper Product Company. Uh, it's a mill that closed down in 1985, and it contains industrial waste that has been a concern for many of my constituents and of myself for quite some time. This issue has represented a significant environmental challenge for the community and has certainly been an ongoing concern of mine and the, as the local MPP. 
Can the minister explain how the MNR is taking the lead and moving forward with the cleanup of this industrial waste disposal site? Thank you, Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, members humble in his question, but I want to thank him, uh, the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, for this important question. Uh, I know this is a very important issue to the member and one that he's been advocating for a positive resolution on for quite some time, and we're moving forward largely because of uh, the leadership uh, that he's shown on this issue. The uh, CIP mill ceased operations in Hawkesbury in the 1980s at a time when there were no legal requirements uh, in place for the company to deal with the cleanup of the toxic uh, sludge, the remnants of the operation. Fortunately, today our province has stricter environmental regulations in place, and waste disposal sites are required by law to have an approved closure plan in place as a condition for obtaining certification. Our government's launched phase one of the cleanup project uh, with respect to the clown, crown land portion of the site. This includes a two-year uh, pilot that focused on testing uh, in a responsible and effective way. And we now have some data and information from that I'll share in the supplementary. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that informative answer. I'm glad to hear that our government now has more stringent environmental regulations in place so that this kind of issue will not occur again in the future. It's important to my constituents and to myself that this project be completed as soon as possible, and it's great news that your ministry has made this project a priority. I'm also pleased to hear that uh, much of the rehabilitation uh, can be done by local contractors, which will bring uh, jobs and create uh, substantial economic activity in Hawkesbury and in my riding of Glengarry, Prescott and Russell. Uh, speaker, could the minister please update the members of this House uh, again uh, when the mediation, uh, remediation of the waste uh, site is scheduled to begin? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, so I'm pleased to inform members of the Legislature uh, that the information and experience gained by MNR during the pilot will be used to finalize the design and methodology to rehabilitate this section of Crown land. The member from uh, Glengarry Prescott Russell will be happy to know that MNR is seeking a private contractor to lead the rehabilitation. Pleased to announce that a full scale cleanup of this site is scheduled to begin uh, this spring. This is a multi million dollar project that will run until 2016 and will include. Uh, as the members indicated, local contractors. The ministry is committed to providing regular community updates regarding the project uh, to the town uh, of Hawkesbury and through their website, we'll be doing that. Cleanup of the site will contribute to improved air and water quality, and the landfill site will become uh, green space suitable for general recreation. Once the project's been completed, the lagoon will be opened up to the Ottawa River, uh, providing aquatic recreation Answer. and uh, scenic opportunities. Thank you. New question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Education Minister. Minister, you, your party, and your Premier have been clear that extracurricular activities are crucial to student success in our schools. So they are. Well, we, we agree and we think that they should be protected. Your collective bargaining bill sits before the Standing Committee of the Legislative Assembly, where it is entertaining over 70 amendments in attempts to appease every union from Kenora to Cornwall. In my letter to you yesterday, I made one simple request to ensure that parents know that after the summer break, when school is back in session in September, when your government is bargaining with the teacher unions, that extracurricular activities are protected. Minister, will you honour that request? Good question. Minister of Education. You know, I, I just can't get over it. Last week in committee, last week in committee, this member sat there and said we had not had enough consultations on Bill 122. I have spent, I have spent, and my ministry has spent the last several months talking to unions and school boards and directors, all the people who sit at the table on collective bargaining, talking about what amendments would school boards like to see, what amendments would, would unions like to see. We've worked with everybody. We've negotiated dozens of amendments which have been agreed to by both the unions and the school boards. Answer. And he has the gall to get up and accuse us of working with people to reach agreement. I don't get it. Sir. Thank you. Supplementary. Wow. Well, Mr. Speaker, what the minister doesn't re realize is that request came from the Ontario Catholic Trustees Association, so she should get her facts straight. Minister, we saw what happened last time you governed on a whim. Basketball and volleyball se seasons were put on hold. 
choirs were muted, extra help sessions cancelled, debate clubs were shut down. Parents will be the first to tell you that extracurricular activities are a vital part of the school experience, that the academic, athletic and social benefits are essential to the kind of education our students deserve. We are not prepared to leave this to chance. Will you agree to our recommendation to give parents and students the peace of mind that the rich education experience won't be held hostage at the bargaining table? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister? Yes, yes, this is really, really interesting, Speaker, because the, the critic over there may not have been involved in education during the Mike Harris days, and I don't know how he did this, but he's accidentally, maybe, deliberately, pulled a play from the Mike Harris handbook. Mike Harris spent eight years arguing about an amendment to the Education Act to make extracurricular activities mandatory. Do you know what happened during the eight years of Mike Harris? We had more chaos, more strike days in the history of Ontario education than ever before. I am not going back to running the education system the way Mike Harris ran. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from uh, London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and uh, Long-Term Care. <laughs> um, yesterday, my colleague, the MPP for London Fanshawe, and I wrote to the Minister about the ongoing funding challenges oh, yes. facing St. Joseph's Health Care in London. Last week, Londoners watched as the political pressure and media attention around this funding shortfall forced the minister to finally take action on the unfunded mental health beds at the new forensic hospital in St. Thomas. But the problems and cuts have continued. Can the minister answer the question we posed in our letter about whether she has a plan to prevent other cuts to frontline health care in London? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question because I was very pleased that uh, that we are uh, ramping up uh, the uh, capacity at the new regional mental health centre, uh, the forensic mental health centre in uh, in St. Thomas. Speaker, this is uh, uh, they had 80 beds before. The new facility has got 89 beds. Uh, that is often what happens when a new building is built, that it's built for future expansion, That's and that expansion happens over time. So we were planning to increase the uh, funding, and we did, in fact, increase the funding so that more people could be served in that particular facility. That was the right thing to do. It was. Uh, 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 what was what was in the works um, anyway, and I think the people at St. Joe's, because I met with the CEO of St. Joe's in London, and we discussed this very issue. Uh, Speaker, Answer. Uh, I will I will look forward to the supplementary to talk about what more we're doing in uh, St. Joe's. Thank you. Supplementary, the, the member from uh, London Fanshawe. Speaker, because of this government's choices, St. Joe's is being forced to cut three percent of its budget this year. This has meant cuts to 23 positions, including eight nurses, and the cuts may not be over yet. Our constituents are concerned, and they want to know that this minister isn't acting when political pressure mounts. Can the minister provide assurances to the people of London that patients' needs and not political interests are driving her funding decisions? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, as I said, I've met with the uh, hospital CEO, Dr. Jillian Kernahan. We discussed what uh, changes they are making. They have assured us that patient care will not suffer as a result of this. The member opposite knows that we are changing how we fund hospitals, and we are doing it so that hospitals get funded based on the number of patients they serve. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we are bringing fairness to hospital funding. That means some hospitals are seeing an increase in their budgets, others are seeing uh, more challenges. 
We are doing it in a responsible way, Speaker. The people of St. Joe's know exactly what's coming on that front, and they are, I think, doing a very good job managing the uh, uh, funding given the, uh, the changes in our health care system. More services are moving to the community. Yes, and the member opposite knows that, yes, some people are, uh, are being uh, uh, replaced, Speaker. Others are being hired. Thank you. So this works both ways. Your question. Uh, no, too late. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.